Kia ora katou, nā mai hāri mai. Um, welcome back to everyone. Welcome to this EHF live session. We've still got a few people rolling in, but I will just admit them all in as we're going along. So uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship, for those of you that um, are new to this session, um, is a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers. We've got creatives, investors, change makers, who are all part of the fellowship and wanting to make uh, the world a better place. And today's session um, is gonna be run by Matthew Jackson and he has got with um, him Paul Bennett and um, Harman Madden, who's actually yes, in India, as we we're saying before, at four o'clock in the morning. So Matthew's gonna to run today's session and any questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can put your hands up and ask those questions. It is being recorded but note um, your face won't show up unless you're actually speaking. Okay, over to you, Matthew. Oh, and this session is finishing at quarter past the hour. So um, if you do have to leave on the hour, just, just gently say so in the chat, but then you can watch the rest of the session afterwards. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, kia ora, Michelle, and uh, welcome everybody. Look, uh, first of all, I thank you for taking the time uh, to join in and as, as tradition in New Zealand, and I think as we celebrate Māori language, we're actually going to start with an open karakia. Uh, for those of you that are new to the fellowship, the Treaty of Waitangi is a very inherent part of um, the practice of taikiangi, where we, we actually use te reo and, wave it and weave it into the fabric of our day. And so I just wanted to open the session today with a, a karakia. Um, so, uh, kia hora te marinia, kia whakapapa, Unamu te moana, he hararari, mai te tau, e te rangi nai, aroha atu, aroha mai, te tau, ia te tau kai toa, hui e kaiki e. So what that basically means is, uh, may peace be widespread. And the reason I chose it is it talked about the sea being the greenstone and a pathway for us for all this day. And... I start my day every day with a walk along the water and why I decided to join Haman and his venture is that we are really focused on re really water security in New Zealand. And so the end of the karakia was just saying, look, let us show respect for each other and for one another, bind us together. And I think that's really important because really what we're here to discuss today is that we need to start to democratize climate action and have everybody contributing. You know, we we don't need to have sustainability or climate in our job title in order to take action to prevent climate change. And really the circular economy is kind of a place where every job has climate as a part of action within it, right? So in particular, uh, we're, we're here today because we really want to discuss kind of the industrial side of that. Um, you know, biogas can really actually displace fossil fuels, heating, electricity, generation, and it, in addition, when it's cleaned of contaminants, it can be used for fuel for vehicles and otherwise replace natural gas. And digestates can, you know, replace fossil-based fertilizers. So I think we're also going to have a challenging conversation today. And the reason for that is methane actually, um, as a warming effect, is often 30 to 34 times more potent than carbon dioxide over, uh, over 100 years. But New Zealand has actually excluded biogenic methane from its emissions targets. And at the same time, but there is a, a significant opportunity because biodigenic um, digesters are, are really forecast to increase in, in significant size. Um, but that's enough for me today. Um, I am so privileged and I'm actually getting a few chills just talking about it um, because we have uh, here Dr. Paul Bennett with us. And this is a quite a unique opportunity for us, I think. Um, Paul is the chair of the industrial, sorry, the International Energy for Bioenergy, sorry, the in, chair of the International Energy Agency Bioenergy Group. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically the IEA is really committed to shaping a secure and sustainable energy future. And they do that by tackling clean energy projects, um, collecting data and providing training around the world. Now, this means fundamentally that Dr. Paul is at the heart of global energy dialogue of bioenergy. So it's a very unique opportunity we have to speak with him today, which is why what we've done is tried to put as much time into Q&A 
Um, and the back half of this talk today is really designed to have an interactive approach for, for us to be able to draw from his knowledge and his experience over the last few years. Now, for his day job, Dr. Dr. Paul is actually the portfolio leader of integrated bioenergy at Scion Research Group. That's a Crown Research Agency that specializes in research and science and technology development in forestry wood products and wood derived materials. So just really, really pleased that Paul has decided to give us his time today to, to spend time with the fellowship and we'll make sure that it's, it's really easy for anybody in the fellowship to be able to connect with him um, after the call. And I'd also have the pleasure of introducing um, my co-founder in Elementary Systems, Haman Madan. Uh, you know, I guess this is the time where I say thank you to, um, I guess the, the fellowship itself, you know, uh, even Te Ati Ara, I think, has played a big role in, in providing a landing space for the fellowship. It's, it's where we get the, the values from for the fellowship. And, you know, and thanks to Michelle and everybody that's involved in setting these calls up, because if without that, I wouldn't have had the pleasure to, to meet Haman. And, you know, you know I, I appreciate him dialing in at a, at a god awfully hour in India. And to do please give us some... Um, a little bit of leeway if if the audio cuts out you know um we know that the internet is constrained during the global pandemic so let's remember that we still need patience in these meeting environments um now a little bit about haman uh yeah he's a, he is locked out of new zealand through because of miq at the moment but you know his background is being involved involved in things like the development of the galvanizing bioenergy agri resources policy which eventually turned into the sustainable alternatives for fuel um, for alternative transportation in India. He's worked with you know, large organizations like Veolia to develop wastewater plants in India and, and worked with on smart cities initiatives um, supported by J Japanese investment cooperative agencies and been an advisor to the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation in India. So, you know, we have a breadth of knowledge and resource from these two speakers today. So I'm really excited and um, I would like to hand over to Paul now to, to take us off. Uh, and I will um, start to share my screen. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew, for that, for, the, for your kind words and introduction. Um, just a, whilst Matthew is doing that, just a, an extra bit of context about myself. I, I have been at Scion for seven years now. Um, yeah, yeah, as Matthew said, it's a, a it's a science organisation. Um, science with an element around trying to achieve some impact an impact for the good of New Zealand so uh, not out and out fundamental science but but so, certainly a bit more applied um, but prior to that role I had a range of different um, roles um, in industry and in a range of startups so I had 22 years at BP working on uh, to the last eight years around liquid biofuels and then worked um, as a consultant in a range of different startups um, um, at different stages of their trajectory and in different areas of renewable energy. Um, but today really um, we'll, we'll focus on, you know, what is bioenergy? What are the advantages of bioenergy? Look at New Zealand in particular and look at New Zealand's emission profile um, and what, where we need to target um, emission reduction opportunities. Um, start talking about what the potential is for bioenergy for New Zealand. Um, where I think the focus areas are, and then I'll hand over to ha Haman to start looking at some specific other opportunities. Next slide, please, Matthew. So what is bioenergy? But well, bioenergy is any sort of energy carrier that is derived from biomass. Um, and so it can be a gaseous biofuel, it can be a liquid biofuel, or it can be a solid biofuel. And all these are in, in use around the world at the moment. Um, gas, um, and, and solid, it just, um, in particular used for um, process heat. Um, so generation of high temperatures for process heat in New Zealand, um, we're starting to use um, solid biomass um, in dairy um, factories. Um, in, in other parts of the world, um, we're using biogas in uh, process heat or in uh, combined heat and power applications. So Europe particularly big around power production from biogas. And then liquid biofuels, well, there's a lot of um, um, biofuels in use around the world. Um, 
some people using ethanol and 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 oil and fat derived um, biodiesels, but now we're starting to think of more advanced liquids, um, which are chemically and physically identical identical to the petrol, diesel, aviation fuels that we we produce from fossil fuels. So, um, what are the feedstocks for gaseous um, biofuels, we're, we're really particularly talking about wet wastes. Um, so wastewater is quite common feedstock for uh, biogas production, um, animal slurries, um, food, food wastes, uh, fruit pulps, uh, and, and in some parts of the world, purpose grown crops. But for liquid biofuels, um, again, traditionally um, for ethanol, which I'm sure most of you have heard is, is a, a blending component with petrol, uh, sugar and starch crops are, are the dominant feedstocks. We've also got oils and fats producing biodiesels, um, but both biodiesels and bioethanol have blend limits. So you can only get a certain proportion into the finished product um, without affecting the overall um, performance of the fuel and without affecting vehicle warranties, for instance. Um, but now we're, we're starting to talk about more advanced uh, biofuels and that opens up a whole range of different feedstocks such as wood and straws to produce those, those biofuels that are um, chemically and physically identical to what we're currently using. And for solid biofuels, well, clearly, you know, um, wood, wood's wood uh, used as wood chip or converted into wood pellets or straw and straw pellets, all of which can be used just, just to burn, to raise heat. We've been doing it for millions of years as humans. It's, that's not rocket science. Uh, next slide. So what, in terms of New Zealand um, and the energy markets in New Zealand, there is a bit of a misconception. A lot of people talk about New Zealand's energy uh, being really sustainable and 80% of our energy um, coming from sustainable or renewable sources. Well, that, that's wrong. It is power. 82% of our power comes from renewable sources. But if you look at the pie chart on the left, our total primary energy was 60% of our, the energy used in New Zealand still coming from fossil fuels. So uh, we have to get that right. And, and, and the power proportion, I know these aren't direct comparisons from total primary energy to electricity consumed, but the electricity consumed is only a small portion of the total energy use. So 16% as shown in this, this slide. Next one, please, Matthew. So in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions, um, and Matthew sort of touched on this earlier, um, if you, if, if you look at the emissions in terms of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, um, you see that 44% is, is carbon dioxide and 43% is that, uh, from methane. So big contribution from agriculture to our overall emissions. Um, but um, methane is treated differently in the net zero carbon bill. Um, and the net zero carbon only really refers to um, um, long-term emissions um, uh, or, or, or those species that uh, stay in the atmosphere for a long time. So uh, carbon dioxide carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. So if you look at carbon dioxide only, um, you actually see 91% of, of New Zealand CO2 emissions are related to energy use, fossil fuel use. So transport, heat and power. And so if we're going to do anything about reducing our, our uh, CO2 emissions, if we're going to do anything about um, progressing towards net zero, um, then we have to do something about the energy sector. Next slide. So there are other strategic drivers for bioenergy as well in New Zealand and, and around the world. And you find that, you know, all these, these drivers have 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 had significant influence on policy setting and implementation of biofuels in a whole range of countries so energy security and independence is a big issue it's actually what started the drive around bioenergy in brazil in the 70s um, they had problems with crude oil uh, delivery because of issues in the uh, middle east um, and they started their sugar cane to ethanol um, um, program then so energy security is a big issue um, and it's i think Personally, it's a 
particular issue for New Zealand. We sit at the end of quite a long and complicated supply chain for for crude oil and for crude oil products. And, and we're only a very small point at that. So, so whatever we can do to improve our position around energy security and independence will be a good thing. Um, and also that area will be exacerbated, I believe, with the closure of Marston Point, um, which is scheduled for closure in um, June. So that's New Zealand only oil refinery. In terms of carbon footprint, well, we're starting to hear uh, a lot of the markets around the world are becoming really much more cognizant about um, embedded carbon products or carbon footprint. Um, and New Zealand being an export focused uh, economy, this is a really important issue to us. And just to put that in perspective, um, the humble kiwi fruit, we export a lot of them across the world to Europe in particular, 60% of the embedded carbon of a kiwi fruit is associated with um, combustion of transportation fuels in getting that kiwi fruit from New Zealand to the end market. So fairly significant. And then regional economic development is important. So, um, you, you know, um, anything we can do to produce energy and, and, and provide um, a boost to the economy and jobs will be positive in the regions. So with biofuels, we think the most likely place we're going to be growing some of the feedstocks will be places like Northland, East Cape, Central North Island, all regions that require some ec economic boost. And, and again, just to relate the energy security and economic development piece, um, New Zealand imports uh, um, crude oil and crude oil products to the tune of $11 billion per annum. So anything we can do to offset that has to be a good thing. Next slide, please, Matthew. So um, New Zealand has started um, implementing legislation. We are behind the curve. Um, I would say the, the, the uptake and, and thinking around um, climate change and bioenergy has only really started at the back end of last year. So the Climate Change Commission started talking about really wanting to increase the amount of renewable energy, um, phasing out coal and natural gas and looking at alternatives. And the alternatives being, uh, you know, uh, bioenergy, uh, electrification and hydrogen. And I think going forward, they will all have a role to play. Uh, there will be no si single silver bullet, but I think they will all be important. Um, and the government on the back of that Climate Change Commission has started uh, implementing implementing legislation. It's it, it's investing two hundred million dollars to decarbonise um, um, government assets, so schools, um, buildings, etc. So uh, two two million dollars going into that. There's there's another fund called the Giddy Fund, aimed at decarbonising industry, and that's um, that's uh, fifty million dollars. <laughs> Um, and then we're starting to see specific leg legislation coming uh, in terms of phasing out fossil fuels in process heat, particularly targeting phasing out coal and then ultimately nat natural gas. So, you know, um, New Zealand's using about two million um, tonnes of coal um, to, to um, raise heat in, in um, food processing plants and other plants. Uh, and that's what's being phased out, as will uh, there'll, there'll be no new coal boilers um, installed in New Zealand from um, next year. From a transportation perspective, um, there has also been a consultation document put out by the Ministry of Transport and MB, um, looking at ways of increasing uh, biofuels in transportation. Um, the draft document is sort of saying um, that they want to see a 3.5% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2025. Um, that 3.5% greenhouse gas emission reduction translates to maybe 5% uh, volumetric um, substitution of fossil derived petrol, diesel, aviation fuel with um, bio, biofuels. They have also um, started um, uh, a feasibility study around um, um, sustainable aviation fuel. So MB are supporting activity around that and trying to encourage uh, 
the importation of technology to address um, sustainable av aviation fuels. Next slide, please. So in terms of, in terms of process heat, um, you, this, this slide was taken from a presentation given recently by ECA, the Energy um, Efficiency and Conservation Agency, part of the, the New Zealand government. And they showed what they felt was going to be the transition roadmap as we move away from um, fossil fuel um, to um, alternatives um, over the next um, um, 15 years. So if you just focus on the left hand, uh, the right hand slide, this shows the amount of heat actually provided into the system. Um, and you can see on the, on the left hand side of that, it's predominantly coal that is providing the heat. If we move across the right hand side, you can see it's a mixture of electrification and biomass, um, mainly biomass. So that's the, that's the trajectory um, the government are looking for in terms of process heat. Next slide, please, Matthew. And then um, in terms of liquid biofuels, and Cyan did a big piece of work um, with a range of stakeholders across New Zealand from a range of different sectors. So energy providers, energy users, um, forestry um, companies, um, iwi, et cetera, and, and, uh, and government. And, and this was really targeted around what, what would a, a large scale uh, biofuels industry look like for New Zealand? What would be the key features of that? And, and I just listed some of the key, key conclusions here. W one would be that we'd really fo focus only on um, specific vehicle types and, and therefore specific fuels. So large focus around ships and planes, and that's because those vehicles are very hard to decarbonize. Those are long range applications, um, long distances between refueling points. And so actually liquid fuels are incredibly energy dense in comparison with batteries or in comparison with hydrogen. So if we're gonna do um, biofuels, we focus on um, ships and planes. We also, um, if we're gonna have a large scale um, activity around biofuels, we do not displace arable um, production, food production. That land has to stay in food production. And so the most likely feedstock would therefore be um, forestry feedstocks. And we know, um, you know, Scion knows there's a lot of um, feedstock available. We leave um, 6 million tons of, 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 of the harvesting waste in the forest every year. Um, maybe 4 million tons of that is accessible. Um, and as carbon prices start to, to head up, um, some of the low grade exports come into play as well. So we export 7 million tons of low grade logs to China and we export wood chip to China as well. All those could come into play into bioenergy. And then, then we need to start thinking about if, if that's not enough, then um, energy dedicated um, short rotation forests for bioenergy feedstocks. Next slide, please. So that was a quick run through of where I think um, New Zealand is at in terms of um, bioenergy. It is embryonic, it is, but it is starting to move and it is starting to move quite quickly. Um, we believe the focus areas for New Zealand are around aviation biofuels, marine biofuels, solid biofuels, um, biogases, and then the feedstocks associated with all of them. So, so with that, then I think I'll hand over to Harman to get a bit more specific around um, biogases. Thank you, Paul. That's a, a very useful overview, I think, for all of us here. I'll now look at what the energy potential really is from waste in New Zealand. Here we need to recognize that Given New Zealand's focus on uh, the primary industry and the export of agricultural commodities, this is actually a significant opportunity. As Paul was talking about at the start, we have different types of biofuel depending on their phases of solids, liquid, or, or gases. Arguably, the potential to harness the energy in uh, gaseous biofuels is uh, significant 
if done the right way. It's also important to recognize here that this can go a long way towards decarbonizing particularly process heat requirements or local energy requirements, as I'll speak about as we go through this presentation. But fundamentally, at this point in time, this is a very recent paper that shows that the energy potential could be anywhere between 15 to 20 petajoules. That's uh, about a million gigajoules. I don't want to get into too much detail here, but, but let's just say that harvesting and processing these wastes would reduce approximately 5% of uh, New Zealand's total energy requirement as it stands in 2021. Next slide, please. We can also begin to as recognize over here that we have an opportunity to manage biogenic emissions in a way that these can actually become an opportunity for New Zealand's primary industry and also towards decarbonizing its uh, overall systems and processes and also obviously reduce the dependence on imported uh, fossil fuels. Why is this an opportunity? Simply put, there is a distinction between fossil carbon, that is the carbon that's produced from the combustion of fossil fuels, and biogenic carbon, which is what we most commonly see from the production of methane and carbon dioxide by stock, for example. Biogenic carbon can be recycled indefinitely, and therefore that's the argument that we could potentially begin to move towards net zero which is the aspiration by 2050. This might also require a few changes to the way we farm in New Zealand. Arguably, the move from having stock on the paddock towards having stock in uh, feedlots or in stalls is one way to do that. And obviously not just contain the methane emissions from the uh, stock itself, but also harvest and harness the energy potential in the uh, dung and droppings as well. But of course, we need to recognize that within the primary sector, we need to follow the cascade of food, which is what you and I eat, feed, which is what we produce for uh, stock, fiber. And I've lost your audio. Only can you have an energy source that can be recycled or the carbon that can be recycled, but you also have uh, the ability to reduce your emissions and meet your energy security. Next slide, please. But of course, this doesn't come without its challenges. As Paul touched upon, this is still a new and emerging sector. There is still a tremendous amount of work to be done. But we're seeing the policy environment move in the right direction. The emissions trading scheme has included both a default emissions factor and an energy allocation factor. So what does this really mean exactly? A default emissions factor tells us that any form of organic waste as it decomposes will have a degree of emissions associated with it. Now this is qualified in the uh, COP's assessment report. It's a continuously evolving standard and that also gives us an indication of what the global warming potential of a given type of waste is. So this is beginning to be included in New Zealand's emissions trading scheme. There's also an energy allocation factor. If you are to utilize the emissions from waste to produce, say, a biofuel, which then substitutes a proportion of a fossil fuel that's used in a certain end application, then there would be an energy allocation factor associated with that, and therefore an equivalent offset available. Now, this is important because this allows us to put a dollars and cents price to the emissions produced from waste and also for the energy substitution that's achieved by utilizing this fuel in turn. 
this is a significant step because it begins to allow us to see what the financial models could begin to look like and how these would come into play in order to be able to make this uh, a, a doable business or a financially viable business. It will also be required to be done in a way that allows, uh, and this is where we're in uncharted territory for, from a policy perspective, that allows a project, for example, to qualify for both a em default emissions factor and an L energy allocation factor. This has yet to be done. And in fact, that's Haman, I've lost your audio again. If you can hear me, I don't believe we're getting audio through from you at the moment. Okay, sounds like you're coming back. Okay, let, let me take over for a second. Uh, next slide, please, Matthew. Okay, so I've got your audio back again. Sorry, Haman, uh, I didn't hear anything from um, where you started to talk about the fact that no commercial operation has both factors okay. engaged. Uh, so perhaps you can just repeat that in case we've missed that uh, audio. The yeah, apologies for that. So as Matthew mentioned, we do not yet have a commercial operation in New Zealand that is able to account for both a default emissions factor and an energy allocation factor, which is needed in order to ensure the financial viability of a project. That's part of the endeavor of what we are trying to do as, as a startup in New Zealand. We recognize that this could uh, still potentially take a while to come to fruition because as it stands, emissions from biological sources are not counted within New Zealand's nationally determined contributions. And let's assess the example of, of what Paul was telling us in terms of the export of kiwi fruit, for example. Unless we begin to realize that there are emissions associated from the primary sector that happen within New Zealand, separate to the emissions associated through the transport and delivery of these products around the world, we will see that we have a threat to essentially trying to find a way of reducing the emissions footprint of New Zealand. But also, as a lot of people do recognize, is that in the global context, the amount of emissions that New Zealand itself produces as a country is really, really small. However, the opportunity stands, as always, like we discuss in so many other contexts, in being able to demonstrate a better way of doing things and so providing both the technological and the policy and the associated financial models, which could then uh, be utilized in, in determining the right kind of uh, financial system towards moving towards a circular economy. Next slide, please. So how exactly do we think that this could perhaps work? So, as a startup business, what we do is we design, build, and, and commission integrated waste treatment plants. This is a simple system that allows us to process organic waste and capture the methane produced, the biogas produced. There are a few process improvements that are aimed towards ensuring a, a more stable operation across the year because the, one of the operational challenges is in terms of having access to a continuous supply of uh, feedstocks. And so therefore there's the seasonal vulnerability associated with the production of biogas. So we've tried to solve for that technically. There are two use cases that I'll touch upon here, just to give you a sense of, of for how this could potentially work. So our first use case is for a council so we'd look to process biosolids, that's essentially the end product from a wastewater treatment plant, along with green waste. What this does is it reduces the capital outlay for a council. Currently, councils treat these as two separate waste streams, and therefore they have different capital allocation budgets, uh, land allocation, uh, operational structures, et cetera, for this waste. So here, by combining them into a single processing uh, source, you can reduce the amount of capital outlay required. 
potentially reduce the emissions liability on councils. That's another factor that's going to come into the picture now and could potentially threaten uh, the financials for a given council and lead to an increase in rates for rate payers. So by reducing the emissions liability here, there's the argument that one might be able to keep rates stable for rate payers. Further, the energy recovered can then be utilized locally. This is an argument also from an energy efficiency perspective. There is a degree of loss that happens when you transmit energy or transport energy, be it a solid fuel, be it electricity, a liquid fuel, et cetera, from one point to another. So from an energy efficiency perspective, perspective, the energy recovered from an integrated waste treatment plant could be used to offset the energy requirement of uh, the wastewater treatment plant in that council, for example, which as we know are extremely energy hungry. The other example of a case study of, a, of, of what Matthew and I are working on in New Zealand is to install an integrated waste treatment plant for a meat packer. So meatworks are uh, another very significant part of New Zealand's primary industry, but they also have waste products that don't have market value. So most common amongst them is something which is known as paunch liquor. That's essentially the digested or partially digested food within the gut of the animal when it is slaughtered. You also have the animal skins, which may or may not find a market. And then you have face pieces, which is essentially as the, as the name indicates, the face of the, of, of the carcass. And these otherwise need to go to landfill. We're beginning to see that this is changing as well, that landfills are now not willing to accept waste from a meatworks or from a slaughterhouse. And so an alternative is required to be found. And that's where an integrated waste treatment plant can have an application because not only can you process this waste in a more efficient manner, but you can recover the energy. And this energy can be used to substitute coal for the process heat requirements at a given meat factor. So this is another use case. So not only do you take care of whatever waste is available locally, but you recover the gas and you utilize that as an energy source uh, within a contained system. So that's yet another example of energy efficiency and also of the circular economy. Next slide, please. I think I'll hand over to Matthew now and uh, Thank you for listening to me. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Haman. So, I guess, thank you very much, Haman and Paul, for that incredible overview. We've actually covered quite a lot um, of what the bioenergy industry looks like. And I'm going to open up the space soon for questions. And because, really, I think this is the time now to start the, the learning elements. And, and I would encourage everybody to, to put their hand up. You never know what question you're gonna ask is actually in the mind of one another. And I, I'll be honest, I'm actually very new to that, the bioenergy space. So I do encourage you to, to learn more. But why I decided that I wanted to work with Haman on this project was, was quite simply, I saw that the we needed to progress New Zealand to be thinking more about what does it look like to be a circular economy. Um, you know, I, I think personally, I put a, a zero waste aim on my household around three years ago, and I'm looking at what does it look like to offset myself as a carbon, uh, to be carbon neutral as an individual. But we really, in order to, to move to a circular economy, need to start to think about more progressive business models, which are inherently circular. And we, the problem is that in any infrastructure decision that we're making, most of the waste is built in at the design phase, whether it be for, for large scale infrastructure or product design. Um, we, for us to build a circular economy, we actually have to start now. Um, however, what I found and not from just my project, but actually others that I've, I've seen doing this work fundamentally circular and economic models can outperform their existing linear counterparts because it's a change in mindset to see waste and byproducts as something that we have to deal with to something that we can utilize but in particular it it shifts we need to shift away from 
really what I consider asset ownership and more into what what I think is a stewardship model where we're where we're sharing we're sharing knowledge we, we are sharing uh, the the way that we deal with with systems and we are opening up our waste systems to get more transparency around them traditionally what I think we see in New Zealand are what I call waste monopolies um, we have often tried to to specialize in waste and you know we've been told to separate waste but I guess what Haman and I are looking to to prove and validate is that actually combining waste sources allows for a more effective bio gas output and really we're not just looking at um, circular the circular economy from a technology perspective we need to build a new marketplace on top of that so that as waste comes into a system a byproduct comes out that is then valued as a part of that system and taking a very holistic overview of all of the interactions of that system is where we need to be thinking about um, from a design, what we need to be thinking about from a design perspective. So with that, I, I just wanna um, thank everybody for, for, for sitting in on the call and, and open up the, the discussion for um, anybody to raise questions and ask questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the slide now and I will, um, uh, by all means, what I, I, you know, feel free to kind of just raise your hand uh, and then we can um, call on people. Michelle, if you could help me with that, that would be really useful. Yeah, so feel free to um, put your, raise your hand with your reaction or just put your hand up on the screen or if you want to write your message in the chat window and then we'll field them from there. Also, that was a lot of information to take on. Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Cox from the Bioenergy Association. I'd uh, like to congratulate you um, on this presentation today. And um, I'm hoping that it, uh, for a number of people here who are new to the topic, that it starts the discussion for them. It's really important that we start having this discussion because we're moving from a situation where the linear process is dominated and where we have had um, loss of opportunities. Uh, and most people have tended to think of waste as a cost rather than an opportunity. And I think what this discussion starts moving to is that we are talking about opportunities for business, for communities, uh, but also uh, as, as a society in, in total. I think the aspect that we have is that we've got some tools in this particular technology of anaerobic digestion, which not only produces the, the biogas, which can be used as a feedstock for a range of other products, um, and uh, energy is one of those, but it's also a feedstock for making um, other uh, types of bioplastics, etc. But the other aspect is that the digestate, the solids that are left in the process, uh, are very valuable fertilizer if the process has been done properly. Uh, so what the Bioenergy Association is working on at the moment is uh, a strategy of having no digestate go to landfills by 2027. Uh, and we're working, we are in the process of hopefully getting uh, waste minimization funding for developing uh, a certification of the, the biofertilizer. Uh, but that will also cover all fertilizers. So the material that's coming from a wastewater treatment plant right through to the source segregated material, which is the, of course the highest value. And uh, we're proposing to do a number of tests uh, with agriculture, working through with fertilizers that, uh, uh, communities and uh, and fertilizer businesses to uh, have this so it's economically driven so the economics for biogas uh, are, are very sound uh, but there is issues like its capital cost etc that uh, has to, to to get bring this about so we have to work on those but the avenue is focusing on the benefits and the and the products that we produce uh, has got to go hand in hand so is that an investor sees that it's not just a cost, but it's also producing uh, revenue streams for them. So I, I'd like to commend this, uh, this discussion uh, to um, 
to further um, other discussions that um, people might like to have. And uh, certainly the work that we're doing, we welcome uh, anyone to uh, talk with us about uh, any of the uh, opportunities or issues that they might be having. So thank you. Michelle, I think we have a few comments and queries in the chat section that, that we should perhaps address. Absolutely. So did you want to read them out, Matthew? So we've got one there from Tori. Sure. So Tori has said, what are the unintended consequences we should be concerned about? For example, what would a biofuel industry from forestry mean for sedimentation in our waterways? And how does the collection from farms of waste work with regenerative farming? So I think the, the first part of that, I'll, I'll throw to Paul. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, I think I think um, we do leave a lot of waste in, in, in forest at the moment, and we've all seen some of the problems on, around East Cape um, with <coughs> rainstorm events, washing some of the slash out of the forest and depositing it on farmland and on beaches, and that's something that really should be avoided. Um, and so part of the way of avoiding it is to remove some of that material um, and so so that's that, that's I think part of the answer to that um, and also if we head towards um, um, repurposing some of some of those export logs and some of uh, and look at um, short rotation forestry that that doesn't um, that's not an issue for those particular applications. Paul I just want to add to that through some of our research we found that um, the demand for process of replacing process heat, uh, and the, you know, with the with the impending upgrade of coal for replacement of process heat, we actually don't have a, enough forestry stock um, to not impact other industries. Is my understanding? No, so, I would I would challenge that. But no, I'm, I'm very interested. Yeah. I'm, uh, so so, so I think at the moment. Um, People are talking about phasing out up to two million tons of coal. Um, now, some of that will go to bioenergy, some of that will go to electrification, but let's just assume all of it goes to bioenergy. Um, that would require four million tons of, of green wood. And that's what we, we're currently leaving in the forest at the moment. As I said, there are other things also available like those chip um, wood chips that are exported and the low grade logs that are exported we, we're exporting nearly seven million tons of low grade logs to China and there are people now looking at those logs uh, with a view to chipping them and burning them for energy purposes here in New Zealand so I think there is plenty of feedstock to certainly to, to, to get okay. going if I can add to that um, the, the myth of there's not enough biomass is only because of the way we've been thinking about um, the whole forestry land use, is that there is no doubt that we can have adequate biomass uh, to meet all of the demands for each of the applications, whether it's uh, liquid biofuels or whether it's uh, solid biofuels for process seed, uh, or whether it's for making bio-based products. But we actually have to, as a community, uh, see the opportunity and to recognize that uh, the opportunity of growing trees is um, for virtually virtually all of us. Now, if we're in the city, that's a bit hard, but in the country is that I look out of my window at the moment, I look over a dairy farm, I can see where trees have been previously planted uh, on slopes, which are no longer planted on slopes. The dairy cows who on that farm don't like going on that slope, it's unsafe for them to be on that slope, is replanting back uh, the trees that were there before having managed shelter belts, uh, a three row shelter belt that is able to be a crop as well as uh, the, produce the product of shelter is, is where we need to be thinking. So it's about changing our paradigm shifting, not just from a linear to a, a circular economy, but into a total land use. Um, we have environmental management plans, which uh, are now being rolled out for farming. Really, they're only a, a, a nitrogen plan they aren't an environmental plan. We need to have them as a full environmental plan so is that the, they're managing the land from the front of the property to the back of the property uh, and the steep slopes uh, and the parts. The 6 to 9% of a farm which is not highly productively used can be used uh, for growing biomass. 
Uh, then there's the other country, uh, hill country areas where um, at the moment we are trying to still put stock on land which shouldn't have stock. Uh, that is much better uh, to grow trees. Some places have, have short rotation trees. Uh, in South Canterbury, um, they're putting in uh, grass, uh, miscanthus, because the boom irrigators are such that uh, you can't have high trees under the, the boom irrigators. So rather than having nothing, uh, they're putting in miscanthus, which is a, as a short and an annual. So that is a source of biomass which is uh, able to be used. We currently burn our straw in Canterbury. We should be using that as, as a fuel, uh, as is done in China. Most of the pallets in China come from straw, not wood. And so the avenue we have to do is we have to think of ourselves in a total circular economy, which is looking at our land use and managing uh, our land so that it's there uh, for perpetuity and not as we do at the moment, where it, as we're still tending to think short term. So extension of the circular economy into all of the ways. And if we do that, then there is no question there is uh, plenty of biomass. If we don't do any of those things, then yes, there will be shortage. Aman, did you have anything to add in relation to um, collection of waste from farms or the way that waste would work with regenerative farming? I do. So as it stands, we recognize that there can be a utilization of waste on a farm itself. This actually is, is a benefit to the farmer. To give you an example, in the New Zealand context, you have dairy cows that are ushered onto a milking station typically twice a day. There's a typical physiological reaction in the stock that they tend to uh, you know, produce waste while they're being milked. And all of this then collects in a pond, in a settling pond. Now, this is actually a great uh, feedstock for biodigestion. You can recover enough energy on an average uh, stock holding uh, of, say, 450 to 500 cows and produce significant amounts of biogas. That biogas is usually enough to provide the milk chilling requirements for that given uh, milk yield. So the milk that comes out of the cow is at 38 degrees Celsius and it will spoil at that temperature. So it needs to be chilled before it's transported to a processing center. Now you can utilize the dung that's produced at the milking station, attach a small biodigester and you recover enough biogas to run a generator, which could then chill that milk down to five degrees Celsius ahead of transport. So that's how it would work in today's day and age at a very local small scale for a given farmer. And what's left over, like we've already touched upon earlier, is a very high value organic fertilizer, which then could substitute a proportion of the, the synthetic nitrogenous fertilizer that a farmer is using on his paddock. So there's actually an additional benefit. Now, there's also been other comments around the ETS and the default emission factors and the uh, energy allocation factors. If the ETS in New Zealand evolves to a degree where it allows the farmer to claim those, right, it's an added financial benefit that would point towards the, the commercial viability of putting a small scale biodigester on a stock farm. And that's the, the direction we need to be moving in. I think what's also important to note over here is that we aren't going to solve for climate by thinking that we're going to come up with some big bombastic innovation that will fix. It. That's not going to happen. What's needed instead is multiple small scale solutions across farms, uh, across crop farms, stock farms, et cetera, that utilize whatever biomass is available locally, because that then also minimizes the transport costs. That's another factor that's been spoken about. And so, we begin to see now that when we look at the entire life cycle cost, if we are able to access the ETS in a more effective way, we find commercial viability come through as well. Okay, well, um, I want to just uh, bring Benjamin into this, yeah. this query. I appreciate your patience. Um, ben, would you like to present a question to the floor? Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for all the fantastic information as well that um, everybody's provided. There's a couple of points I just kind of wanted to touch on was 
Um, first of all, was on your point, Matthew, of that kind of whole circular economy and business models and, and trying to get companies to cut, buy into those. And it's also then looking at scope three emissions that companies are doing and allowing that and getting them to, to provide a lot of the support right the way through their supply chain. And it's quite evident within the dairy industry that that is possible because they have that direct link down to their supply chain. And then I also wanted just to touch on, and it kind of links in, I wanted to touch on um, Brian's point on the, the bio and biogas has such a potential to be part of a wider fuel service. For instance, in the UK, the, the, um, the government's just announced that biomethane from manure will actually be certified as a carbon negative fuel source. And there's a company there called CNG Fuels who are turning that biomethane into biodiesel. And they're targeting that heavy transport industry, um, which is kind of massive emissions um, by trying to convert it into a carbon negative. And I think by next year, those companies that are with CNG Fuels will be able to instantly say that they're carbon negative, they're carbon neutral, sorry. So I think there just needs to be more work from the bigger industries and also governments to to try and encourage this fuel potential that's coming from the, the dairy farm and just the agricultural industry in general. Touching on, on Harman's point there that the biogas potential could, could chill the milk, but it has so much more potential if it can be used further down that supply chain and for and, and a wider scope. Um, and I think it's, it's, it, it would be exciting to try and bring some of those technologies to New Zealand um, and try and encourage them here to not just make any energy potential from biogas, but also to decarbonize those heavy transport industries as well, and then link in with the shipping that we were touching on before. Um, I'm, re it just, I'm really interested sorry, to open this. Oh, sorry. I'd just love no, to give on. Paul, Paul, um, Paul the space to, to give us some insight into what he's seeing on a global scale. I'm just conscious that, you know, we have limited time with him at the moment and really he's he's going to be aware of all of the mechanisms that are potentially being used overseas that could be applied to New Zealand. So um, Paul, I'd, I'd just like to open up a space where you could potentially tell us, um, you know, what do you think it is that is missing from this environment? Where do you think, I guess, the, the areas that you're most interested in from a Scion perspective, and then I guess New Zealand, New Zealand as a whole? Uh, and what, I mean, I guess as well, where have we failed and potentially where do you, what can we learn from that? I'd just love to provide that the space for you to give us some insight. Yeah, so um, I, I think we're just playing catch up. I think that's where, what I would say. We are so far behind the, the uh, curve here. You know, you look at Europe, you look at some parts of Asia, Americas, um, they've been working with bio, biofuels, bioenergy for a long time. Um, it's a, and, a, and as I said in my presentation, it's only really been the back end of last year where we've started to see a little bit more interest um, from the government in bioenergy and therefore um, and maybe catalyzed by some of the comments of the Climate Change Commission. But now we're starting to see legislation coming in place that is sort of driving us down these roads that we, we have an opportunity now to, 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 to learn, to learn what other um, countries, what other jurisdictions have done well and what hasn't worked in those places, what legislation has been implemented that, that, that really drives us and it will accelerate us forward. Um, so that's, that's what I would, yeah, those are my main comments. You know, we, we can do a lot of this stuff. Um, personally, I think New Zealand is an ideal place to, 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 for, for bioenergy to really, really take off. We've got the land. We've got available land. We've got some of the feedstocks already. Um, we've got the, the um, climatic conditions to grow and we even more feedstocks and, and dedicated feedstocks, whether it's for uh, biogas applications or liquid biofuels applications. We've got all that. Um, let's just get on with it. And let's get the legislation in place that, that encourages it and not, not um, hopefully not take a, a step backwards when governments change which is what's happened here in the past. I mean, Paul, one of the things I think about the secular economy is that it, it fundamentally, it, 
it creates an economic advantage to these types of mm. technologies. Now, I'm wondering, is it, you know, is it the, is the only reason that we're looking at bioenergy now in New Zealand because of um, the fact that we're getting pressure from, uh, you know, our uh, the Paris uh, climate accord? Is it is it is bioenergy being driven by climate? And so, are we actually missing the opportunity of bioenergy in New Zealand? And no, I think I did try and emphasise. I mean, climate is is an important factor, but there are other strategic drivers here as well around um you know our image and the image of our pro export products um and the, the carbon embedded with them um our vulnerability to the, the the fossil fuel markets and and our exposure to that um so, so so there's a lot of other factors that that need to be taken into account and i think legislation i mean the you, you know we shouldn't just rely on education uh, on on legislation but it is needed at this stage to catalyze what we're doing, I think. Okay. Haman, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, you know, I know that you can bring the lens of, of doing a lot of work in India, some frustrations you've experienced in that market. And what do you see is the, the thing that's really going to catalyze the New Zealand market if we want to see bioenergy here? Obviously, it's the ETS that's going to be the most significant driver there will be a capitalistic approach. So the stick comes in from the default emission factors of waste and the carrot comes in in terms of the energy allocation factor. So a combination of those two will definitely help. There are obviously, as Paul already spoken about, the vulnerabilities associated with the transport into and out of New Zealand, both of you know whatever New Zealand needs being an island nation there's a, an associated emissions cost around that. So alternatives will have to be found. But the ETS is going to be the, the game changer really for New Zealand. And maybe if I can just add, add to that, just to give a bit more context around that, um, just looking at the carbon prices and, and what's been happening with carbon prices here in New Zealand. Um, last year, the carbon prices were anything from 20 to $35 a ton. They're currently sitting at $65 a ton. The Climate Change Commission are saying that we're going to need carbon prices of $140 a ton by 2035 if we're going to be on a trajectory towards net, net carbon zero. Um, they're, they're also talking about prices up to $250 a ton by 2050. And I also mentioned the um, sustainable biofuels mandate, which is tied to carbon reductions and the penalties are tied to carbon reductions. And basically, the, if, if a fuel supplier doesn't meet its allocated target of biofuels, then it will be fined the equivalent of $350 a tonne of carbon. Now, these, th th this is all draft. This is a consultation document, but, the, but that's what's on the table at the moment. Yeah, and I, I'm just conscious. Um, if, if anybody else has got another question, can you please raise your hand? Otherwise, I'm just going to continue this line of discussion. Um, Matthew, uh, sorry, Matthew, there's a very interesting comment from uh, Mike Hart, I think, around uh, green hydrogen. Mike, uh, Haman, I can you read it out and then take, take us in that just direction, please? So, okay, I've got it here. I was surprised to see, surprised to not see renewable hydrogen as one of the specific biofuels being targeted. Most of the facilities we have been asked to look at in New Zealand have been asked to make H2. Yeah, is okay. That the one? Yeah. So, I, I can address that from two perspectives. One, we are looking at hydrogen, we're looking at distributed hydrogen from low grade wastes. Uh, so, you know, that is something we're, we're looking at. And there's also potential of couple, coupling hydrogen production with um, uh, biomass with a technique called gasification where you produce hydrogen and CO2. So if you can capture the CO2 at the same time as you're producing hydrogen uh, and you can then lock the CO2 away somewhere um, like an exhausted um, natural gas well, 
then you've got what's called negative emissions. And so there's countries around the world looking at that. It's called bioenergy and carbon, carbon capture and storage, or BECS. In terms of use of hydrogen in um, transportation applications, and I said we're really focusing around aviation and, and um, marine, those are two long distance applications where we still think liquid biofuels are important. And if you look at um, the number of um, vessels that were being built in 2019, um, Ninety-four percent of them were still fuel. Uh, were still going to be fueled with liquid fuels, and and those vessels are going to be on the seas for a long time to come. So there's going to be a, a, a long demand for liquid fuels. Same goes with the aviation sector. Um, yes, Boeing and Airbus are talking about hydrogen or electric um, aircraft, um, but they're only going to have limited range. Their aspirations, and I use that word. Again, aspirations are to have vehicles in place by 2035. So we're still going to be using liquid fuel, liquid aviation fuels for a long time to come. And even after 2025, it's, you know, we're still going to need liquid fuels for the long haul flights. And 80% of Air New Zealand's pre-COVID um, emissions came from long haul flights. So we're still going to need liquid fuels. That's why we're focusing on, on, on biofuels in those sectors. Mark, do you have, sorry, Mike, do you have anything to add to that? Is Mike, Mike is Mike, are you still on the call? By Mike, you mean me? No, yes. Mike Hart, I believe that question came from. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you. No, I appreciate it. It's, it's interesting that hydrogen has come up over and over again in most of the communities we're talking to in New Zealand. Um, as a, an interesting fuel source that folks are, are liking to pay attention to. Um, on the, the, our online calculator, the number of requests we're getting from New Zealand as uh, hydrogen as the end product from garbage um, is really rising. Um, so I don't know whether there's some incentive or something like that going on that's driving it, uh, but it is coming up quite frequently. Certainly over the past three or four years, there's been a lot of interest from um, the government in, and supporting a range of different activities around hydrogen. Um, and they, but, but they are quite specific. I mean, there's, the, there's some uh, interest in, in um, uh, coastal shipping. There's some interest in some of those, the heavy duty routes. Um, and there are hydrogen refueling stations being built at the moment for um those those key trunk routes in New Zealand, but it is still quite a small portion of the overall um, transportation um, duty. Yeah. Yeah. The concern that um, my two cents on this is the concern that I have around us looking at hydrogen is <clears throat> one, the technology definitely has promise, right? particularly as Paul said, if we can have carbon capture and storage associated with it. The factors that when we talk about what we call a hydrogen rainbow of green hydrogen or blue hydrogen or brown hydrogen. <laughs> Currently, the maximum hydrogen production is from brown hydrogen, which is essentially fossil natural gas. And the other limiting factor with this is that the infrastructure required for hydrogen to utilize it as, as an alternative to fossil fuels as it stands today does not exist, which means we need to create all new infrastructure, unlike existing infrastructure where our current biofuels can be a drop in. Now, uh, Paul was talking about the biofuels mandate in New Zealand. Today, every single internal combustion engine that is, is produced, and especially because New Zealand imports most of its vehicles from Japan, you can blend biodiesel up to 5% with petrol diesel, and there will be no discernible impact on its uh, uh, warranty because there will be no detrimental impact on its performance. You could blend up to 10% ethanol with petrol. And again, you would have no negative impacts uh, on the engine. So there is a direct substitution possible with biofuels. Similarly, biogas upgraded to biomethane is a drop in biofuel for much of the North Island's existing reticulated gas network, which doesn't exist for hydrogen, right? So there is the risk of being led up the garden path in terms of investing and in creating an all new infrastructure for hydrogen. 
Plus, it is my belief that it's something of a red herring because once you're committed to having made that ex, uh, undertaken that expenditure, where are you going to find enough hydrogen to put it in uh, that system? It's not going to come from green hydrogen. It will come from brown hydrogen. So all we'll do is extend the runway because there will be a sort of a fait accompli associated with the production and use of hydrogen, which then will essentially be brown hydrogen. So I think we need to be a little mindful of that. Okay, look, I, I'm just conscious of time. Um, Paul, is there anything else that you want to add before we close off? Um, my intention is to do a closing karakia and then leave the Zoom open for anybody else that wants to still continue this discussion, uh, connect and share details. Um, so Paul, I hand sorry. the floor to you. Yeah, just to, sorry, just to break in, I won't be able to leave the Zoom room because I need it at 1.30. Got it. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. No, I, I would just like to thank thank you all for the opportunity. Um, uh, some very interesting questions. Um, hopefully, if if you haven't got the answers, or if, if after some reflection on what you've heard, you've got more questions, I'm more than happy to um, answer them. So, um, please share my details with all the attendees, and obviously the slides with all attendees, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. And Haman, do you have anything else you want to say in closing comments? Just a very big thank you to everyone who took the time to be here. Uh, I don't know how many uh, had an opportunity to have their questions addressed, but as Paul said, we're happy to, to speak to people one-on-one, -on -one, answer their queries over email. So everyone who's joined us today, thank you for your time. And please feel free to reach out. Okay, well, um, with that, um, I just want to acknowledge EHF. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much for, for enabling this platform. And, you know, I'm just really privileged to, to be able to be a part of this community. Um, I will make um, all of the, the slides available. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that everything that we've discussed actually has a link on our website, uh, elementary dot systems and i believe michelle will be making the video available on the um, ehf website as well if you'd like to share that um, i encourage you to follow uh, elementary on linkedin uh, uh, connect with paul on linkedin connect, connect with myself or Harmon on linkedin if you'd like to continue this discussion and um, for those of you inside of the the edmund Hurry fellowship slack channel we'll, we'll put contact information as well in the um uh, uh in the environmental stream so with that, um, uh, I'll just do a closing karakia. Um, uh, kia tau to rangamari eri, kia ranga ina iwi o te ao. Let your peace reign on all the people of the world. And uh, I, I chose that simply because of the fact that I know that we're all dealing in, uh, in an environment at the moment that's quite stressful uh, with restrictions on travel. Uh, with lockdowns. So, um, you know, I really hope that, you know, what you took from this call is uh, what, look, what I took from this call is actually, there's, there's actually a quite a, 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 a lot of passion in the community in New Zealand. Paul, I think actually we have more bioenergy resources in New Zealand than we, than we're really aware of. Um, and Brian, I, I want to acknowledge and thank you for your contribution as well as um, the others that have, have joined the call and contributed today. So with that, um, I want to close the call off and I wish everybody uh, an enjoyable rest of their day. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. See you, team. See you next time. Kaikite.